Welcome back to another fun-filled episode of INST 314 Statistics for Information Science. We're still in the Statistical Foundations module, but now our topic is going to extend into sampling and inference. We're going to start combining some of these things on how we go ahead and collect our data to how it's going to match up to when we start wanting to generalize from our samples back to our populations and what that's going to look like. So let's go ahead and take a look. So going back to this whole idea that we keep revolving around here, and I'm going to keep hitting this hammer until we find a nail that's going to pound in, that we have populations and we have samples. And we really just, getting the population information is difficult for a wide variety of reasons. Therefore, we are unsure about what that information is. There's an, a degree of uncertainty. So we use samples as a way to get information about the population, and we're going to use statistics as that bridge. Now, because we are using a sample, and it's just a portion of that population, there is a degree of error. So what we say before is that samples give us statistics where populations have parameters. They're analogous. But when we go from the sample to the population and the statistic to the parameter, there is a degree of what we call sampling error, the difference in our estimation. So we need this inferential process that we're going to go through. Just like we were saying before with the data analysis workflow and the programming workflow. This is a similar sort of process that we go through from start to finish to help us get the information from that sample about our population. So it starts with defining the population. And we said before, that's just talking about the group that has the commonality of at least one common trait. There may be more, but at least one. Then we establish our sampling procedure. We talked about those last time, like convenience and stratified and simple random. From then, we go ahead and draw this representative sample, that subset of the population. We go ahead and use an inferential analysis, which we're going to be learning more about as we go through this course, things like t-tests and chi-squares, ANOVAs, regressions, correlations, etc. Each statistical inference, sorry, each inferential analysis and the techniques for them incorporate an amount of sampling error into the results, and we'll learn how each of those takes that into account as we go. Once you're done and you draw your conclusions and evaluations, go ahead and share those with who you need, but make sure you're going to be transparent about your findings. This is very important for accountability. So just to kind of recap this again, statistics come from samples where populations have parameters. Can you see where I'm going that this might be a test question? Once we're talking about estimations, there's two kinds that we're going to need to think about. Point estimates and confidence intervals. Point estimates are, uh, boom, one shot, here's a number, there's what it is. So we can say a newspaper story reports that 74% of a sample of randomly selected Americans supports capital punishment. In this case, 74% is the point estimate, a single digit, or rather, single number. Confidence intervals, however, are different, where it has a range of values. We can say the example of between 71 and 77 percent of Americans approve of capital punishment. In this case, 74 percent is contained within the 71 to 77 percent, and so it's giving us a degree of flexibility. You could use one or the other, both of them are going to mean equivalently the same thing based on a margin of error. So let's take an example and see how we can break this out. If we know that 42% of a randomly drawn sample from a city are Republicans, we can estimate the percentage of all city residents who are Republican. So in this example, which one of these is the statistic and which one is the parameter? And is the estimation value given here a point estimate or a confidence interval? Go ahead and pause the video for a moment. I'll wait. Okay. So if we know, again to recap, 42% of a random sample drawn from a city are Republicans, we can estimate the percentage of all city residents who are Republicans. Identify the statistic and the parameter. The statistic is the 42%. We have a sample, and the data points from that sample is the statistic, 42%. The parameter, I didn't mean this to be a gotcha question, but the parameter is unknown. We are trying to infer to all members of the city who are Republicans. And for a wide variety of reasons, we can't get that information. So the parameter exists. We just don't know what it truly is. And is this a point estimate or a confidence interval? 
it is a point estimate, 42%. We aren't giving you a range of percentages that it might be. We're saying it is here, 42%. Let's go ahead and talk about bias and unbiased estimation. It's a characteristic of an estimator's reliability. Well, what does that mean? What well, we said before that there's some amount of error, some amount that we're going to be off when we go ahead and pull our estimates as we're trying to estimate the population's parameter. And there's what we call the standard deviation of an estimator. So an estimator is this idea that there's a group of estimates that we can go out and get. And of those estimates we get, there's an error of those estimates. And that's the standard error. It's not quite the same thing as the standard deviation of the sample, but it's on the right track. We use a formula for it by saying that every standard deviation we have can be divided by its square root of the sample size. And they get, that gives us the standard error of the mean. I said before we have these two groups, bias and unbiased. And the bias is saying that when we go out and get our estimates, that on average, it's not going to equal the parameter. This is because we're using just straight n, the sample size, in our estimates, rather than doing an n minus 1. Why would you do an n minus 1? Well, this is a way for us to be conservative, and I don't mean conservative in the political sense, like liberals and conservatives, but I mean conservative as in cautious. A lot of times n appears in the denominator, and when we take one off of it, it makes n a little bit smaller. So when we divide up, it makes our estimates a little bit larger. And when we're talking about that estimate being the error, the how much we could be off, we're giving ourselves a little bit more wiggle room and saying, I could be a little bit more off than what I'm saying before. So by doing an n instead of an n minus 1, we're more likely to be biased. We're not guaranteed, because we really don't know the population parameters, so we're not guaranteed. But we're more likely to be biased. Whereas the unbiased version, because we're doing an n minus 1, then on average, we're going to be able to equal the parameter. We're not going to get too far into the weeds on calculating this out, but I'd like you to be able to understand the concepts. So that takes us to just again kind of talking out there that there is this underlying truth. There is an answer to the universe. Are we going to get to know the answers of the universe? Probably not, unless you happen to know it's already 42. But, sorry, that's a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy reference for you. But what we're saying, though, is that there's a population parameter out there for us to find, and we're going to do our best to try and do that with statistics. So this brings us back into this idea of the sampling distribution logic. We talked about samples, we talked about populations. Sampling distribution is yet another method in between samples and populations. And so we get this idea that if you go out and get a sample, it's a snapshot of your population, but we can go ahead and get more samples. I can sample again, and again, and again, and again. And I can treat this class as a sample, and I can go to every other class in the iSchool as a possible sample to be representative of students in the iSchool. And each time I do that, I'm going to form a sampling distribution. The sampling distribution is a, a distribution that contains the statistics that kind of summarize the statistics from all of the samples. And so if we sample enough times, then the sampling distribution resembles the population. We're going to talk more about this later when we get into central limit theorem. So this all bleeds back to this idea that being a statistician means you'd never have to say that you're certain. It's not letting you off the hook entirely. You still have to put in the footwork. But there's always going to be a degree of uncertainty that says, you know what, I got it wrong. But we're going to try and minimize that as we go. And that's going to wrap up this idea on sampling and inference. And we'll come back next time with study designs.